Well, welcome to A Cloud of Witnesses. My name is Robert Paris. In this episode, I want to talk about the Hebrews Revival, which occurred in 1949 through 52. I believe there's a lot that we can learn from it, and I believe there's a call to take up that torch because we are about to see the greatest revival in church history. To understand it a little bit better, let me go back a little bit in time to the 5th century when, of course, St. Patrick, and you can check out a new video on this, went to Ireland and, of course, introduced Christianity to Ireland. He raised up a series of disciples, and in the 6th century, there was a man called Columkill or Columba who went to the Hebrides and started a monastery there. At that time, monasteries were Bible schools that were raised up to educate uh, believers so that they could go forth and preach the gospel. So there was a spiritual heritage in this island. After the Reformation, there were a series of revivals that did occur on this island. This was not the first revival. In fact, a revival occurred in 1939 that was stopped by the war. These people on this island had an understanding of revival, and when they saw the spiritual decline that occurred after the war, it began to disturb certain people. Among them, two elderly ladies, one who was 82 and blind, and another sister that was 84. They had this small cottage, and as they looked at the youth, and saw the youth being lost, it caused them to get on their knees and pray. They stood on Isaiah 44, I believe verse 3, uh, where the, the Lord would pour out water on the thirsty and streams on the dry ground, and the call and the promise was aimed at the youth. They got hold of a now promise from heaven and they prayed it. They started to experience more of the presence and something in them. One of them had a vision, and as a consequence of the vision, spoke to the local pastor. Thank God for godly pastors that hear, and he responded, James McKay, to that and he agreed that they needed to pray. Now these two elder ladies would take, and they would pray from about 10 o'clock at night until two, three in the morning. They prayed for a long time into the wee hours. They were people of prayer. Sometimes we wanna pray a quick five minute prayer instead of pressing in and holding fast until God releases us. So they now started these, um, twice a week, prayer meetings where people came together and they covenanted to prayer. They got hold of that God as a covenant God, a God who's faithful to His Word. And because of that faithfulness, as they stood on His promises that God could not and would not fail that promise. Isn't that a boldness of faith? It was out of that that these people began to press in. As they pressed in and they're experiencing the presence of God, they see what's going on outward. But the first thing God did was something inward. They've been praying for a while and not seeing the breakthrough they expected. Now realize many of them 
had seen the revival, they'd seen the revival of 39. And they're desiring that again. And if you've ever tasted God and a revival and a move of the, God, the Lord, it does something in you. So they are pressing in and they recognize, one of them recognizes, how can we ascend the hill of the Lord unless we have clean hands and a pure heart? Unless we get right, unless there's a change here, there won't be a change outward. And so they get themselves right with the Lord. And that begins a series of changes. Now, all of a sudden, the presence intensifies and they get this expectancy. We go from the stage of desperation seeking to a series of transformation to an expectancy. And then God really leads them that they need to bring somebody in. There is that what I call spark. God uses people in unique ways. And it's sometimes hard to understand because when we look at a revival, sometimes we tie it to one person. For example, the Welsh revival, we tie to Evan Roberts. But there was a cast of characters just like in this one. And that's what's so beautiful about this revival is we really see the cast of characters. Those that were interceding and then the person that God would bring that would be the spark. So they invite um, Pastor or Reverend Duncan Campbell. He was a man that was born, I believe, in 1898. And in 1913, um, he was coming home. He was, I believe, at a dance. And he gets so convicted by the Lord that he leaves. And on his way home, he sees the church lights on. And he's drawn to it. He discovers they're having a revival service. And he goes in and he hears his father praying and he's convicted more. So then he makes it home and his mother's there. And of course, he would have an encounter with the Lord. You know, God loves those that are wrecked by him with a true encounter, a revival. Because it's real to them. And so with Duncan Campbell, he understood revival personally. He would, of course... Um, travel. He traveled throughout Northern Ireland and Scotland. And ultimately, he was the person that God would lead to come forth at the right time as God was preparing the ground. So he turns up in December of 1949. He has traveled all day to get to the Isle of Lewis. And when he arrives at the pier, I love what they say to him. One of the elders of the church meets him, and the first question, are you right with God? You know, how many would even dare think or say that, but they understood that this was something of great importance. The people were expecting revival and knew they needed somebody that had a right now relationship with the Lord. So Duncan Campbell then leaves the pair. They take him to the church. And you can imagine he's probably tired, exhausted. I'm sure in many ways he would like to have just gone and taken a rest and just, you know, I'll preach tomorrow. But he goes and at nine o'clock they open up this revival he begins to share and there's like 400 people. It's a good service, but the revival hasn't happened. And we've got to learn to discern a revival where the presence of God turns up in that revival way and a good service. And they understood that. It wasn't bad, it was good, but it, they hadn't had the breakthrough yet. So at 11 o'clock, he's done. He's very tired. He comes down, he starts to walk down the aisle, and one of the elders walks with him. All of a sudden, that elder is struck by the Lord gets down on his knees, this man, this layman, I should say, he was just, and he begins to pray. And what I love about Duncan Campbell was the humility that he tried and recognized that this, this man 
had a relationship with the Lord that was different than his and steps back. And this man begins to pray and cry out to the Lord. Lord, you promised. You cannot, you will not fail. There was such a confidence in that prayer that he did. Holding fast what they already knew, what had already been resolved in prayer before. That they had done all they were supposed to now was the time for the revival and he keeps praying there's a deep cry out from him he went into a trance they opened the doors of the church and somebody cries out to Duncan Campbell come come quickly come quickly so he comes and all of a sudden there's a mass of youth who had been at the dance hall busy dancing and enjoying the world when suddenly they were convicted by the lord god a fear of the lord came upon them that they were disturbed and knew they had to get to the church there is a place where god whistles and calls and people knew And so they begin to run to the church. Well, Duncan Campbell goes back in. And they now have a revival meeting. That revival meeting would last initially for about five weeks, this series. And we see in the revival there were waves people would begin, and I should say there was in a second wave, um, there was another part of it, and one of the places they would, would spread throughout the whole island. There was a place they went to, and here they're meeting in a house, and they are gathered, and it's just not happening. And sometimes we come to a place and it has not broken through. There is a heaviness, there is a resistance, and sometimes we quit. Thank God these people had a perseverance and a toughness of spirit. They refused to quit because they understood this covenant relationship with God. And so they ask this man to pray, a layman. He was a smith, and his name was Smith. He prays a simple prayer. It is not, some of these prayers were extremely simple. They were not phenomenal when we think of prayers that just, wow! They were simple. Because they were built on promises and a covenant God. And he holds God, God, if you do not move, your name is at stake. And all of a sudden, the house literally shook. They discovered later that the other houses around did not shake. They assumed it was an earthquake. But God shook that house right at the right moment. And of course, the revival there broke up. Like many revivals, the revival went beyond the church building. The altars were not just inside the church. The churches were filled, and in fact, people had to sit on the steps of the pulpit. They were filled to overflow, but they went on beyond the church services. People continued, and they went from house to house sharing. The expectancy grew And people were being convicted everywhere, at work, at fun, and at church. You would see people on the street and in the field, or at work, 
suddenly being overcome by the conviction of the Holy Ghost and needing to pray. And so the altars were found on the streets and in the fields and in the buildings, wherever the Holy Ghost would meet with these people. They had all kinds of manifestations which are typical with revivals. They saw people swoon. They saw people fall under the Spirit. People go into trances. But the manifestations did make the revival. It was the lasting relationship with Jesus that was the greatest fruit of the revival. These people developed a relationship with the Lord that would go beyond the three years. Thank God for seasons of refreshing. But those seasons, we must then get a personal revival that continues to walk with us forever. These people were radically changed. And as I said, it impacted society during that time period. Now, when I continue on with that revival, I look at the hour that we live in. One of the people at the revival was the mother of President Donald Trump here in the United States. I'm not trying to make a political statement. You either love the man or hate the man. But what is interesting and should be something that stirs the church is that his mother was there. And the Bible she had from that revival, she gave to Donald Trump, who, at his swearing-in ceremony as the President of the United States, the 45th President, he put that Bible on top of the other Bible, and he swore in on using that Bible. He would, of course, visit the Hebrides as the president. And I pray that God would so use the man and, and, and meet with him because we need a revival today. And I think that God is showing us, stirring us to see in this hour that he is a covenant God to remember what he's done before, just as they did in the Hebrides, and that we would see him too as a covenant God. And in this season, and this is a difficult season, this is the time of the coronavirus quarantine, where we are being separated onto ourselves in many ways. But let us seek after him and walk with a clean hand and a pure heart before the Lord, so that we can descend the hill of the Lord. Lay hold of a now word from heaven and become expectant of what God is going to do on the earth in this hour. Let us get a fresh now promise that we are standing on and let us hold fast with a perseverance because we need revival in this hour. Every revival came after a moral decline, which globally we are seeing a massive global decline. It is an anti-Christian hour, but it's also a difficult, difficult hour of really the beginning, I believe, of the sorrows or the birth pains of the coming of the Lord. This is not an easy time, and lives are being impacted, and right now, we, the church, need to pray. The answer is not found in a politician or in science. The answer is found in Jesus. He can use all these things, but we need Jesus. 
I pray that the Holy Ghost would disturb you in this hour and that together we would seek His face with an intensity and perseverance. It would be nice to think that these people in the Hebrides revival prayed and there was an instant result. There wasn't. They prayed for four to five months. There's often a season of pursuit, but God is faithful. And in Joel chapter 2, the call is clear to sound such an alarm, to awaken His people, to return, repent, and render our hearts in the hope that He will return to us and to seek Him. And then there's a promise that He would return and He would give us both the latter and the former rain. The latter rain we've seen and the former rain we've seen in previous seasons. We've seen that former rain which was widespread that started in the early spring and the great awakenings of the early um, church. We've seen the latter rain these sporadic revivals, drenchings that occur that were more localized and are continuing today. But what we have not seen is the latter and the former reign together. So many of the heroes of faith understood that as we read Joel 2.28, then after this, that there was coming something before the Lord's return, the end time period a great and the glorious, most magnificent outpouring of the Holy Spirit that would have the latter and the former reign. And the church would finally be restored. I believe we are living in that hour. And it's time for us to seek His face and return to Him, render our hearts, and begin to intercede for the body of Christ. I pray this message would provoke you. And as you look around, you see things through the eyesight of heaven and would develop a sensitivity to His calling that's creating a disturbance in you, a holy disturbance that causes you to get on your knees and pray. If you do not know Jesus, this is the time. This is the hour to receive Him now. He died on the cross and He paid the price for you. It's simple. All He asks you to only believe. That He died for you to come as you are and be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. To come and let Him wash you of your sins and that by grace through faith, you would receive Him in your heart and confess Him with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. It's that simple. And I ask you, would you just join with me and pray, Father, I come by way of the blood. I come as I am, a sinner. I come to you this day, and I see that Jesus paid the price for me on the cross. I thank you. I receive that. And I receive Jesus into my life, into my heart. I thank you, Holy Spirit, fill me. And right now I confess you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior in my life. Thank you. Have your way in me and through me. I am yours from this day forward. Amen. If you're a believer, I ask you to join with me on Facebook and pray daily for revival. Now is the time. Hear the clarion call from heaven and let us stand together and seek his face and give him the rest until he does that which he said he would do, do because his name is on the line. Thank you in the name of Jesus.